Good morning, and welcome to Fluor's third quarter 2023 earnings conference call. Today's call is being recorded. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. A question and answer session will follow management's presentation. A replay of today's conference call will be available at approximately 10.30 a.m. Eastern Time today accessible on Fluor's website at investor.fluor.com. The web replay will be available for 30 days. A telephone replay will also be available for seven days through a registration link. Also accessible on Fluor's website at investor.fluor.com. At this time for opening remarks, I'd like to turn the call over to Jason Landkamer, Head of Investor Relations. Please go ahead, Mr. Landkamer. Thanks, Jordan. Welcome to Floor's 2023 third quarter earnings call. David Constable, Floor's Chairman and Chief Executive Officer, and Joe Brennan, Floor's Chief Financial Officer, are with us today. Floor issued its third quarter earnings release earlier this morning, and a slide presentation is posted on our website that we will reference while making prepared remarks. Before getting started, I would like to refer you to our safe harbor note regarding forward-looking statements, which is summarized on slide two. During today's presentation, we will be making forward-looking statements which, which reflect our current analysis of existing trends and information. There is an inherent risk that actual results and experience could differ materially. You can find a discussion of our risk factors, which could potentially contribute to such differences, in our 2022 Form 10-K and in our Form 10-Q, which was filed earlier today. During the call, we will discuss certain non-GAAP financial measures. Reconciliations of these amounts to the comparable GAAP measures are reflected in our earnings release and posted in the Investor Relations section of our website at investor.floor.com. I'll now turn the call over to David Constable, Floor's Chairman and Chief Executive Officer. David? Thank you, Jason. Good morning, everyone. And thank you for joining us today. Please turn to slide three. In response to investor inquiries from our shareholders, I wanted to provide some insight into how Fluor is leveraging artificial intelligence technologies across the organization. As some of you may recall, in 2018, we had entered into an industry-exclusive partnership with IBM to develop a predictive analytics solution for large projects. Based on a significant database of over 200 projects spanning 20 years, we continue to expand the use of this platform to supplement execution across our portfolio. At the same time, we launched a parallel effort to create an AI platform to provide predictive pricing on materials for our supply chain. Outside of these two major predictive solutions, Fluor is currently using over 60 AI-derived platforms across IT, tax, treasury, human resources, proposal development, and plant and facility services. This is in addition to a number of simulation and rule-based AI-enabled systems that we have deployed to support project execution. These systems are helping Fluor reduce costs and drive a data-driven decision-making process that leads to better project management and quality control. Now let's turn to our operating review beginning on slide four. Revenue for the third quarter was $4 billion, representing our third straight quarter of 10% growth over the prior year. Our increase in revenue was led by Urban Solutions as we ramp up execution activities on several recently awarded projects, including a large metals project in the US, two life sciences projects, and a semiconductor project. Consolidated new awards for the quarter were $5 billion remaining on track relative to our full year plan of a book to burn ratio of greater than one. New awards were 94% reimbursable and our total backlog is now 26 billion of which 70% is reimbursable. We continue to see strong demand for our services and the value we provide. Margins on new awards were 70 basis points above the margin profile of our existing backlog. The demand for our services is evident by our prospect pipeline. We continue to track a slate of prospects that is more than 15 times the size of our current backlog. This is led by opportunities in chemicals, closely followed by production and fuels, and mining and metals. 
As you will see over the next few slides, our financial discipline, combined with our focus on selectivity and project execution, are starting to drive consistent results. Moving to our business segments, please turn to slide six. Urban Solutions reported a $66 million profit in the third quarter. Results included an incentive fee earned on a large mining project that is nearing completion, as well as a favorable arbitration outcome on a separate mining project. New awards for the quarter were $1 billion, and ending backlog is now $11.1 billion and 59% reimbursable. Now please turn to slide seven. In mining and metals, we continue to work on a number of front-end studies, including critical minerals production and green steel technologies. Although there have been no cancellations, the industry has been carefully monitoring inflation inputs and commodity pricing. We're now starting to see clients move forward with final investment decisions. Earlier today, we announced a multi-billion dollar reimbursable award from BHP for stage two of their Janssen Potash project in Canada. This award will be recognized into backlog in the fourth quarter. Looking ahead to the first half of 2024, we see significant opportunities in lithium, steel, and copper to bring into backlog. Moving to slide eight, our advanced technologies and life sciences business line had another active quarter. Last month, we announced the completion of Bayer's first global cell therapy launch facility. This new state-of-the-art biopharmaceutical development and manufacturing facility will be used to produce cell therapies for neurological degenerative disorders, cardiovascular disease, and other current unmet medical needs. On the new awards front, ATLS was able to build off its successes in the second quarter. This includes an initial award for a semiconductor facility in the Pacific Northwest and an award north of $400 million for an expansion facility for a key strategic customer in Denmark. We were also awarded a feed package for Ultras AB for the world's first industrial scale sodium ion battery production facility. We are excited about the pipeline of reimbursable opportunities in this business line. Over the next few quarters, we are positioned to win significant additional semiconductor work and multi-billion dollar opportunities in life sciences. In infrastructure, we continue to make significant progress on legacy and non-legacy projects during the quarter. On the Gordie Howe project, we had a very productive summer with great progress on the bridge and the U.S. and Canadian ports of entry. In August, the team celebrated the topping off of the U.S. Tower at 722 feet. The project is now 65% complete. As we mentioned last quarter, Fleur, along with our partners, continue to have collaborative discussions with the Gordie Howe client with respect to cost and schedule relief. Our joint venture team is working to resolve these discussions in the next few months. Moving on to slide nine. Mission Solutions reported a segment profit of $38 million for the third quarter, compared to $29 million a year ago. Results for the quarter reflected increased execution activities for FEMA hurricane support. New awards for the quarter included the $175 million four-month extension at Portsmouth, a new award for AFRICOM under our LogCap 5 contract, and additional task order awards under our FEMA contract to support hurricane-related efforts in Florida and Georgia. Last month, we were also informed that our contract for the NNSA's Naval Nuclear Propulsion Program was extended for five years through 2028. Fees from this $8.5 billion extension will be recognized as equity income. During the quarter, our team submitted our bid package to the NNSA for the Pantex Management and Operations Contract. This contract includes a five-year base period with three five-year options valued at up to $30 billion over 20 years. We expect to have an update on this contract next year. Moving to Energy Solutions, 
please turn to slide 10. Segment profits significantly improved to $177 million from $59 million a year ago. Results reflect the initial recognition of cost recovery entitlements on several fixed price projects, partially offset by cost growth on a large upstream legacy project and a charge for the expected net settlement of a long-standing claim. Results also included a $24 million gain on our embedded derivative in Mexico. New awards for the quarter totaled $3.3 billion and included a confidential reimbursable EPCM contract for a large chemicals project in North America. For the fourth quarter, we are anticipating some sizable reimbursable new awards. Prospects include a large battery chemical project and an isocracker retrofit project, both in Europe, and an LNG facility in Indonesia. Finally, I'd like to note that LNG Canada is now 88% complete, and this project continues to meet management expectations. Before I turn the call over to Joe, I want to note that our results and accomplishments this quarter reflect notable progress against our corporate strategy and is indicative of our ongoing transformation into one of the leading engineering and construction companies in the world. With that, let me turn the call over to Joe for the financial update. Joe? Uh, thanks, David, and good morning, everyone. Uh, today, I will review our results for the third quarter, highlight some of the key capital structure activities that were recently executed, and go over financial outlook assumptions that support our revised guidance. Please turn to slide 12. As David mentioned, for the third quarter of 2023, revenue was $4 billion, a 10% increase from last year. Revenue for the quarter was driven by the ramp-up of execution activities on several recently awarded projects across all three segments. Our consolidated segment profit for the quarter was, a strong, was strong at $276 million. This performance was driven by higher execution activity, as well as the initial recognition of cost recovery entitlements on several fixed price contracts. Adjusted EBITDA for the third quarter was $216 million compared to $30 million a year ago. Our adjusted EPS was $1.02 compared to $0.07 in Q3 of 2022. Our adjusted results for the quarter exclude $47 million for the positive income effects of FX and the embedded derivative in Mexico. G&A expenses for the quarter were $56 million, up from $30 million a year ago. This was driven by higher performance-based compensation forecasts, including stock price influence compensation, which is expected to be paid in Q1 of 2024. Net interest income in the quarter was $42 million, compared to $37 million last quarter and $14 million a year ago. Our reinforced liquidity position will enable us to generate positive net interest income throughout the year with prevailing interest rates on our deposits and marketable securities. New awards of $5 billion in the quarter improved our ending backlog balance to $26 billion. Based on our prospect pipeline for Q4, and as David advised earlier, we anticipate a book-to-burn ratio in excess of one for the full year. Moving on to slide 13. Our cash and marketable securities balance for the quarter was $2.4 billion. This excludes amounts held by NewScale. As it relates to operating cash flow, we expect to be positive for the full year. This includes additional distributions from our joint venture arrangements in Mexico and Canada, which more than covers the cash needs for legacy projects. Any potential client concessions on the Gordie Howe project are not currently included in our cash flow outlook. While we are not discussing 2024 guidance on this call, I do think it is important to note that we expect 2024 to be a significant year for cash flow generation as we start to see meaningful contributions from our growing non-legacy portfolio. During the quarter, we reached an agreement to sell Storks European businesses to Billfinger. We have also launched an effort to transact Storks remaining operations. At this point, we expect all transactions to close by Q2 next year. Now, please turn to slide 14. In August, we completed a very successful convertible debt offering to address our December 2024 senior notes. As a result of our offering being oversubscribed by five times, we were able to lock in a coupon rate of 1 and 1 percent and a conversion premium of 32.5%. 
We also entered into cap call transactions that prevent any shared dilution until our share price trades above $68. Including the cost of the cap call, our effective cost of this debt is approximately 3.47%, slightly lower than the 3.5% of December 24 notes we are retiring. If we had pursued a straight debt issuance, we estimate our cost of funds would have been more than double this market-leading effective rate. A simplified example of how the cap call transaction works can be found in the appendix section of our slide deck. I should note that in advance of retiring the 2024 notes, the proceeds from the offering have been primarily invested in securities yielding over 5%, out-earning our maturing fixed rate debt of 3.5% by over 150 basis points. Lastly, in September, we announced the full conversion of our convertible preferred stock, which further simplifies our capital structure. The cost of this conversion was $27 million, approximately $2 million less than the remaining undiscounted mandatory dividends. We will not have any change to our adjusted EPS estimated calculations as these shares were already reflected in our share count. And now that our 10Q has been filed, our market cap will adjust upward by more than $1 billion. With these transactions, we have rebuilt a capital structure that was pressured over the past few years as we transition back into a lower risk portfolio. Please turn to slide 16. We are raising our full year 2023 adjusted earnings per share guidance to a range of $2.50 to $2.70 and increasing our adjusted EBITDA guidance to approximately $600 million. Our assumptions for the fourth quarter include revenue of more than $4 billion, Adjust, adjusted G&A expense of approximately $50 million, and an effective tax rate of approximately 40%. This may vary depending on countries in which revenue is generated. We expect tax rates to moderate as revenue and our tax advantage locations start to increase. Our expectations for Q4 segment margins are approximately 4 to 4.5% in energy solutions, approximately 4% in urban solutions, and approximately 6% in mission solutions. Finally, we also reaffirm our 2026 adjusted EBITDA guidance of $800 to $950 million, as indicated in our earnings release this morning. Operator, we are now ready for our first question. Your first question comes from the line of Stephen Fisher from UBS. Your line is live. Uh, great. Thanks. Good morning, and good to see the uh, backlog growth there with the cost reimbursable mix. Um, there were uh, a lot of one-offs in the segment this quarter, though, related to older projects. Um, and the language in the release said that you had initial recognition of cost recovery entitlements. So I guess I'm, I'm curious if that means there's going to be you know more of those uh, benefits coming in. How consistent might the recognition be, and, and what did you bake into the guidance for that? Um, thanks, thanks, Stephen. The, uh, I, I, the principally what's driving um, some of the recognition relative to that is is the activities in Mexico, and the way I'm looking at the recovery of those costs are really through kind of the financial discipline and the execution as we drive. Um, to more positive conclusions on some of our lump sum um, projects. And it's, it's a process. Um, it clearly was uh, part of our entitlement in, a co in our contract, but we had to work our way through it. So there's a portion of that. We always had it outlooked in Q4, but we were able to um, recognize it in Q3. So it was part of our guidance overall, but I think um, the majority of those projects now are close to 90% complete. So I do not expect to see um, that type of significant uptick in 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 uh, in a recognition around uh, these cost recoveries going forward. Okay, that's very helpful. And just I guess bigger picture macro, I, I think David, when you're talking about the the mining uh, activity, you mentioned there's there's no cancellations and things moving forward. I guess I'm just curious about related to the kind of stronger for longer interest rate environment. But what do you hear from your customers about the impact of that? Uh, does that kind of create opportunities for you to do more value engineering? Uh, are there any delays? Um, is your project set and uh, pipeline looking more insulated? What do you think about sort of that big picture macro uh, topic? Thank you. Hi, good morning, Stephen. It's David. <clears throat> 
Yeah, from a mining and metals perspective, as you just saw, we had a great award here uh, from BHP uh, earlier this morning up in uh, Saskatchewan for their potash plant. A great client uh, with got a long relationship with BHP due to our uh, project execution performance with them. So it was great to see that. Uh, more generally, uh, we've got about uh, $55 billion of, of front-end work ongoing in mining and metals right now. We see that continuing. Uh, and have another line of sight on about another 50 billion of, of, of front-end work. Obviously, value engineering is also always important uh, across our, our client base to make sure uh, we can drive the best value and the right the right solutions uh, for our customers. So, yeah, mining clients are you know you know big picture investing in energy transition. Uh, minerals and metals. So uh, we see that continuing. Uh, you know, some some of the mid-tier clients are not uh, going after the big multi-billion dollar projects, but their CapEx uh, levels, you know, we track our, our clients' CapEx levels quarterly, and uh, we don't see that uh, softening at all right at this point. So, and with all that front-end work, uh, we continue to remain confident in our mining and metals business, and uh, especially, you know, being such on copper specifically, being, you know, the, the leader in... in uh, in the copper mining space, uh, we feel we're in a really good position going forward. Terrific. Thank you very much. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Andrew J. Whitman from Baird. Your line is live. Great. Uh, uh, good Good morning. Uh, I thought uh, I would ask here, Joe, um, to cut through the noise as much as we would all love to hear and quantify the claim settlement, the upstream charge, and the various other things that ran through your income statement this quarter. I know that you're not going to do that for us. So I'm going to ask that question in aggregate a different way. And so your adjusted EBITDA for the quarter was $216 million. You previously talked about um, your run rate of EBITDA and, and have demonstrated, in fact, the last several quarters of around $150 million of EBITDA. Was the quarter's result, if you would look at it, kind of X the big items that you called out in your release in that $150 million run rate range, or was it different from that? It, it, Andy, what the, thanks for the question. What's happened is uh, we had anticipated um, – the um, the work that needed to be done in order to get to the position where we could recognize those cost recoveries with our client to occur in quarter four. It got pulled forward into quarter three. Um, so you're seeing a little bit of the distortion of that 150 run rate over the Q3, Q4 period that we had laid out in the last call. So some of that is, is being recognized earlier, but I think we're, we're still feeling um, comfortable in that 140 to 160 range going into quarter four as well. Okay. That's helpful. And then I just um, wanted to drill in on your commentary. Uh, you, you'd previously been a little re reluctant to talk about cash flow in 2024. Uh, I think that made a lot of sense. Uh, is it just that we're closer to 24 now that gives you confidence to say that, you know, that there could be significant free cash flow next year? Or is there something in the business that you're seeing um, more confidently today in terms of the business's performance that, uh, that gave you the confidence to, to make that uh, general comment? No, Andy, I, I appreciate the question. I think um, this, is, this is the result of a lot of hard work and clearing out the legacy um, challenges. You can see some of those settlements flowing through the books today. Um, we're getting significantly more comfortable uh, where we are in, in that position. We continue to add very high-quality um, backlog um, at uh, a very uh, good rates um, uh, as experienced in Q3 relative to $5 billion in new award and then coming out next quarter. So it's really a combination of all those things. The other thing that's underpinning our comfort levels around um, uh, kind of highlighting uh, cash generation moving not only into Q4 of this year but into 2024 is we're starting to see some of the repatriation of the dividends that we have been communicating to the market over the last two, three quarters. And in Q4, you'll start to see the the ramp up of, of the return of the liquidity to floor. Great. Thanks a lot, guys. Your next question comes from the line of Brent Salman from DA Davidson. Your line is live. Hey, thank you. Congrats on a great quarter. Um, I, just looking at the slide deck, the expectations for energy segment margins for 4Q, that 
four to four and a half percent, you know, would be below what you've seen year to date. I understand there were some outstanding benefits here in the third quarter. I'm just wondering if there's some specific influences in the fourth quarter in that business group we should consider just, just sort of trying to be prudent given the, the moving pieces of the business. No, I, I we we are for the full year we're at six and a half percent, and uh, it, this is more just a reset after the culmination of of getting to to the recognition of the cost recoveries in Mexico. It's just a bit of a settling of that, a bit of the lumpiness that's flowing through. But six and a half percent, and as we, we look forward to giving you the guide for 2024, but uh, we do not see four to four and a half percent being the run rate moving forward for energy energy solutions at this point. Okay, appreciate that. Um, and, and I guess just taking a step back, I mean, look, you're still facing some cost growth on some legacy projects that's more than offset by kind of positive items in the business, core execution, recoveries. I, is some of these legacy activities move into sort of late stages here? You're ramping up more profitable new work. Uh, you know, I just want to get a sense. Are you more confident that the sort of typical kind of quarter-to-quarter -quarter risk associated with these legacy projects is diminishing? companies in a better position now to sort of more than offset that, um, even if we do see some more cost growth ahead. I'll start, Joe, you can chime in as well. Uh, I'd say we're, we're getting uh, much more confident uh, with the remaining uh, legacy work. Uh, there are only a few projects remaining uh, that are well along. In fact, the the large offshore project uh, that we're we're looking to finish off is 100% complete and 75% complete commissioned, and uh, and hopefully by uh, the end of January that it'll be handed over to the client. So that's uh, well along. As I mentioned, Gordy Howe is 65% complete, and we're getting great progress there, uh, and having good discussions with the client on uh, revenue recovery. And uh, well along on the LAX People Mover project out in Los Angeles, I think it's 88% complete as we speak. So these uh, these projects are in a very good place now, and uh, with good discussions uh, with the clients uh, where there is uh, revenue recovery required. So uh, that allows us to uh, to have you know good confidence going forward, and as we continue to execute. Uh, Right now, uh, well above our as-sold margins on the on the much healthier backlog that we brought in. Uh, you know, we as we've said, we've hit and passed an inflection point at the company now that gives us a lot of confidence in our numbers and, and that cash <clears throat> that Joe talked about, uh, the year of cash in 2024. No, I, th I think that's the, I, the only thing maybe I would add is you're starting to see some of the financial discipline relative to, you know, the recognition of cost and, and the hard work that's gone in over the last 12 to 18 months to bring some of these claims to uh, very positive um, conclusions with our clients. So uh, I think uh, all that is kind of contributing to the to the positive outlook here. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Andy Kapal. Capital Wits from Citigroup. Your line is live. You got it right. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> close enough, Andy. Something like that. Close enough. Close enough. Uh, David or Joe, I think you said that these positive cost recoveries are part of your guidance, but they just moved earlier into Q3. I, you, but you still raised your EPS guidance significantly for the year. So what else is going right to lead to that raise? And then without giving us an EPS guide for 24, is it fair to say that with the significant backlog growth you have and expect and underlying margin improvement, you would still expect significant EPS growth off of 23's higher base? Well, I, I don't want to guide into 24 yet. I, I think what David touched on, we're having the resolution of the challenge projects and we're coming to um, the conclusions that we expected through a lot of hard work. That's one element of it. And I think David's leaned into, and we're seeing it, is just this higher quality, um, better than um, existing backlog margin intake. And we're starting to burn that um, to burn those those higher quality awards through through the P and L. So like it's just a combination of all that, and and you're going to start seeing that higher quality uh, higher quality margin backlog kind of be the headline story next year as we get back to a lot more consistency around 
how, around how we're reporting out and the cash flow generation around contracts that have um, uh, much better terms and conditions. So I think it's a combination of a, a, a few things that are that are giving us that level of confidence. Yeah, that's a. Uh yeah, you know, that twenty billion we booked in, uh, Andy. The twenty billion we booked in twenty twenty two is really strong uh, margin in there, and we're doing it again this year. Uh, may not get quite to the twenty, but we'll be uh, we'll be getting close to that uh, this year as well. With that same type of uh, margin profile, we expect to be uh, at or near seventy five percent reimbursable by the end of the year. And uh, and we've got execution excellence on uh, you know as I said earlier that uh, we're executing above above our as sold so that all plays so well into into the future and uh, the trajectory uh, positive trajectory for the company here over several years right these jobs will run right now we've got jobs running out to 20, 2026 2027 uh, because they are uh, you know there's a lot of volume a lot of uh, hours t to burn. Over the next over the next several years, and so that gives us pretty good, uh, you know, line of sight uh, going forward. We'll, we'll be uh, looking at the operating plan reviews for 24 uh, in mid-December, and that will uh, that will certainly uh, lead to our guidance in 24 around margins and, and growth. It's helpful, and then, David. Can you give us an update on how you're thinking about new scale? I, I know you said you would look to monetize it at some point, maybe by the end of the year. But how are you thinking about the funding needs of new scale moving forward? Is there any possibility that Florida have to inject more capital into the JV? Yeah, we're we're uh, as we said, we're we're uh, um, in discussions with a strategic investor for the monetization of new scale. Those discussions are are proceeding uh, well. And uh, we do have a term sheet uh, with with our strategic investor, and uh, you know if all things uh, line up correctly, uh, we'll be able to talk more about that uh, at the end of the year or early in the new year uh, on that monetization. So that's that's where we're focused right now. New Scale has a great uh, a great offering uh, in the industry. They're well ahead. Of uh, any other uh, SMR technology, I'd say by five years, uh, easily, and so we're we're very excited about supporting uh, the commercialization uh, of New Scale going forward. And uh, I believe they have an earnings call next Wednesday where they can talk uh, obviously more about your your comments around uh, uh, cash and how they look at that. Appreciate the color. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Michael Dudas from Vertical Research. Your line is live. Good morning, gentlemen. Hey, Michael. Morning, Michael, how are you? Congrats on that World Series victory. Hey, go Rangers. <laughs> go Rangers. <laughs> I'm glad you guys even know there's a baseball team in Dallas. That's good news. Um, oh. Ooh. So, uh, da David, um, you know, you know, you talk, you've mentioned Premier Marks, the extraordinary pipeline that you guys are working on relative to your current backlog. Can you maybe share how how you guys are set up or how difficult it could be, you know, because there is such demand for your services, how you're going about allocating either through sectors, industry clients, and certainly what metrics you're thinking about, and how's your labor and your capacity to uh, execute not only what you have now, but what seems to be a pretty strong, st steep um, opportunity in the future. Yeah. Good morning again, Michael. And uh, right. That's where we, you know, that's where we spend most of our time uh, right now is, is, uh, you know, staffing these great projects and getting, you know, the right talent, the right people, in the right places at the right time, so we can we can have uh, uh, execution uh, success for all of our clients. And uh, you know we have a very uh, structured pursuit process, bid no bid process, uh, where we will only move forward if we have the right teams in place. That's you know I guess the first question we ask before we get into the all the other details. So uh, the whole management teams. You know, just laser focused on on uh, on resources and uh, hiring attraction and hiring uh, of talent into the company, 
done a great job over the last couple of years, brought in over 6,500 people. Uh, over 30% of those folks are rehires, people wanting to come back to the Fleur family as we uh, continue to grow again. So uh, that, that really is where we uh, spend uh, a lot of our time and make sure that uh, we're not bringing in projects that we can't execute. As far as allocation goes, it's uh, uh, we do, fortunately, uh, it's a business where we can uh, cross-pollinate into different businesses as required. For example, with the ATLS business ramping up dramatically, you know, from doing $400, $500 million projects to multi-billion dollar projects, uh, you know, we've successfully uh, inserted, uh, you know, product execution skills, project management skills, uh, product control skills into ATLS from our energy solutions business. So there's, there's always that going on, and we're fortunate that our processes and procedures, which all of us follow, allow us to move people around the company and give us more flexibility in that, in that uh, regard. So it's, uh, yeah, it's nonstop. Uh, we've got a talent task force in place. We've had it in place since early 2022, and uh, that's really uh, working well for us. And given the your your capacity and even it's growing as it, as you mentioned but also the demand for your services can we anticipate you know as we look over the next several quarters that you know as you indicated the booking margins into you know up 70 bits from your current backlog is that a trend that should continue in this environment for the foreseeable future not no varying degrees but certainly see that uh, show up and improve margins into your book backlog you know it is uh, i would say uh I mean, maybe there's a few pockets uh, in our markets or a few customers specifically uh, who have run into challenging times. You know, if you're a chemical client in, uh, in Europe, <laughs> you were challenged with feedstock and you may have to pull back a bit. But uh, everything we're seeing, you know, we look, we've got a key account management process that, uh, you know, gives, keeps our finger on the pulse. Uh, as, along with a client CapEx, we look at quarterly and voice of the customer. Uh, all that front-end work that we track to see, uh, to give us line of sight on what's coming down the pipeline. And I must say, including our government, don't forget our government business where the budgets always are growing. Uh, but the CapEx across, you know, our, our client base uh, is not softening at all. It's either flat, up, uh, or up, and then you, uh, you lay an energy transition on top of that. So uh, with all the... Uh, the war for talent and resources, it, it's a, a bit of a seller's market right now, and margins, I expect, will stay, stay strong uh, uh, on reimbursable work, which is, uh, which is great to see. And uh, uh, I guess that's how I look at it, and I think uh, we'll be able to continue to drive that uh, margin and backlog in the right direction. And it, it's all very dependent on whether you're just doing front-end services work or the full EPC, obviously, and, and how, that, how that comes into backlog uh, definitely affects the level of uh, margin as well. So it's, I think it's positive uh, going forward, Michael, and uh, we're gonna burn it off above those, those, uh, those asphalt margins as well. So that's helpful. Excellent, David, thank you. Thanks, Mike. There are no further questions at this time. I would like to turn the call back over to the presenters for closing remarks. All right, thank you, operator. Many thanks to all of you for participating on our call today. I'm very pleased with our performance this quarter as it further supports our uh, belief that we are, or really past our inflection point now. And with a strong capital structure and high demand for our services, you know, we're well positioned to deliver increased value to our shareholders. So we appreciate your interest in Fleur, and thank you again for your time today. Thanks. That concludes today's conference. You may now